So welcome to using PostgreSQL and friends for a street sweeping solver project. I'm joined by speaker James E. Marka, founding member at Active Metrics LLC and project scientist at UC Irvine, who will discuss how to clean OpenStreetMap data using with recursive common table expressions, convert one-way and two-way streets into a one-way network of curves, convert the street network into its line graph dual, save the solver input, output, excuse me, save the solver output to a new table using Python, display the solver's roots using QGIS, and produce a smooth animation using PostGIS aggregate functions and windowing. A little bit about your speaker. Dr. James E. Marka earned his PhD in transportation engineering from the University of California, Irvine in 2002. He started working with PostgreSQL and PostGIS at that time to stash and process GPS data collected from in-vehicle data collection units streaming data over CDPD wireless modems. He continues to use PostgreSQL as a data store for research projects and websites, and has connected to PostgreSQL from Perl, Java, JavaScript, Python, Elixir, and R. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm gonna be your moderator for this webinar. You can find me under uh, PostgreSConf, and I am the host. And with that, I'll hand it off to James and take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, hopefully the audio is coming through. Looks good to me. Um, as Lindsay said, I'm gonna talk about how we use Postgres SQL and friends for a street sweeping solver project. Um, as you listened to the intro, I heard a lot of uh, alphabet soup and acronyms and so on. And hopefully I'm not gonna do that too much, but I do slip into it. So uh, today I wanna talk about a case study. So that's sort of the focus of the talk. I'm gonna give practical examples. Um, of spatial processing, uh, using recursion, using window functions and so on, and give a little bit of theory, a little bit of background on uh, spatial processing and so on, since I don't think that's quite as common as, as other aspects of Postgres. So uh, just to reiterate what Lindsay said, um, I've been programming for a very long time. I got my bachelor's degree in 89, worked on space station freedom for a while as a system engineer, went to UC Irvine to get my master's degree in transportation, worked in Boston for a while, and then went back to get my PhD. And it was during the PhD research that uh, I first started using Postgres. Um, as Lindsay said, we needed to store our GPS data somewhere. We were using MySQL before that, or I was using it, and uh, the geo support was lacking. So we switched over to PostGIS and Postgres, and that worked great. Um, so we wrote a little pipeline to collect the data and save it to the database. After that, we had to, of course, process the data. So I learned how to hook up R to the database um, and we had to present the results. So I did it from a website. Uh, later we did a accident risk website that was a Java based uh, tool. Uh, we've done uh, a huge node based uh, project to save and store truck data. And you know, I use really Postgres as my go to back end for any time I have um, geo enabled data. So this project is for street sweeping. Um, Everybody knows what street sweeping is. You see the vehicles all the time. The goal for the city is to make sure each curb is swept. Um, so they wanna do that as efficiently as possible. Uh, algorithmically, this is an edge covering problem and edge covering problems are NP hard, which means that uh, you can't expect to ever find uh, the optimal solution. All you can do is find ones that are good enough because the search space is just way too large. So what do we need to solve this kind of problem? Well, uh, of course, first we need geographic data. We need to know what the streets look like, otherwise we can't do anything. We have that because I'm using OpenStreetMap. And we also need a good solver that can tackle these MP hard problems. And I have that in Google's OR tools. So where does Postgres fit into this? Well, it uh, acts sort of as the glue. It uh, stores the raw data, can clean the data, process the data so it looks good for the solver saves the solver's output, and then processes that solver output to display it properly. So as I said, Postgres is my data glue, and it's a smart glue. Um, so before I talk about manipulating the data, I wanna first talk a little bit about what the solver needs. So as I said, I'm using Google's OR tools. That is um, an open source uh, operations research platform put out by Google. 
Um, there's lots of different solvers in that suite of tools. Um, we're using a routing solver to solve this as a routing problem. So that begs the question, what is a routing problem? Well, routing problems, uh, the goal is to find the best path uh, for one or more vehicles, depending on your problem, to visit every node in the network. So you're delivering packages, or in this case, sweeping streets and so on. But there's always practical constraints. So the vehicles have a fixed capacity, for example. And when they hit that capacity, they need to go back to the depot to unload their packages or to pick up more packages or whatever. Um, and then of course, all the vehicles need to have about the same amount of work because you know who wants to be the driver that has to do all the work while the other driver is sitting back at the depot. The computer doesn't care. It's gonna solve and make the most efficient route, but drivers care. They wanna have the same work. And of course, the operator wants to minimize the number of vehicles because vehicles cost money. And the drivers also have rules about when they can work. They have overtime hours and they have break times and so on. So all of these constraints make it a really hard problem on top of the fact that it's already an MP hard problem. Luckily, uh, OR tools is designed around constraints. It's you know, fundamentally based on constraint programming. So there's a flexible way to specify linear constraints and adding constraints can sometimes improve the runtime because it limits the search space that the solver has to inspect in order to find a good solution. So uh, recapping, the solver needs a list of nodes to visit, an all-to-all -all travel matrix between those nodes, um, and then the vehicles and their attributes, where the depots are, and so on. I'm going to focus just on the list of nodes to visit and the all-to-all -all travel matrix. The other stuff is really kind of minor. Um, I mean, it's important in the end, but for this talk, it's minor. So where does that data come from? Uh, again, we're using OpenStreetMap. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's an awesome tool where the data is uh, for all over the world. Um, it's fairly consistent. It's designed and, and put together by citizen geographers, just like you and I. Anybody can edit it, anybody can add to it, and so on. It's pretty great. OpenStreetMap has three uh, core elements, nodes, ways, and relations. Nodes are points in space. So for example, an intersection. Uh, ways are lines, so a street between two intersections, uh, power lines, bridges, and so on. And relations are groups of nodes. So they collect together, let's say, a bunch of road segments to make a long uh, roadway. For example, you can use them for bus routes, or you can use them for, to define highways, and so on. Um, on top of the nodes, ways, and relations, there's tags. So a line on a screen has no meaning. You have to tell uh, you know, the program and tell the viewer, what is that line? So um, they have this tag system. So for example, uh, a tag could be highway equals residential. That would tell you know, the program or the, or the viewer that this is a residential street. There's also a fairly flexible approach to how to namespace things. So this bridge movable, uh, you know, there's lots of different kinds of movable bridges, so you can create a new tag where the key is bridge colon movable and the type of the value is drawbridge and so on. These conventions evolve over time and there's a huge list of the accepted ones on the um, OpenStreetMap wiki. So this is an example of a node. The important point here is that there is a location. Um, only nodes have location data. This is an example of a way. Uh, it has a tag, in this case, a service road. And it has eight nodes to make up the way. Uh, the first one and the last one are part of other ways. So uh, conceptually, that's an intersection. And you know, this service road branches off from Harbor Boulevard, and it ends at Ponderosa Street. All the other nodes in between, remember, only nodes contain the geographic data. So these nodes are like uh, shape points on the middle of the road. And here's an example of a relation. Again, a whole bunch of tags describing what the relation is. And in this case, there are 700 members. So Harbor Boulevard is a very long street made up of 700 small ways uh, along its length. So again, the important point is, or one important point is that nodes hold the location information. Um, so fundamentally, OpenStreetMap is kind of a relational database uh, in that everything refers back to nodes in order to get the spatial component. So um, now that we've talked a little bit about the data, um, let's take a look at sort of the meta problem 
of how do you model street sweeping as a routing problem? Well, routing problem inputs, as I said before, you need a list of locations that need to be reached and a cost matrix for moving between all pairs. So street sweeping, you have to sweep a street and that's kind of like visiting a location. Um, you need to use a network in order to determine your travel times and um, streets need to be swept in a time window. Everybody has seen those uh, signs up that say, you know, no parking on Wednesdays from nine to noon. Uh, sweepers actually pick up debris along the curbs and when their hoppers fill up, they need to go back to the dump site to unload them. So this is almost exactly like a pickup and delivery problem with time windows. Um, the trick here is getting locations to visit. So sweeping a street is the same as visiting a location. And if you think about that enough, and if you remember back to uh, any algorithms class you might've had, um, if you transform the regular network into its line graph dual, then every link will become a node. And that's exactly what I want here. So that's what I'll have to do later. So here's my strategy. I take the OpenStreetMap data, turn it into a routable street network. And from that network, I'm gonna generate a line graph and then generate travel times. And those will be my main inputs in the, the OR tools process. So what I mean by friends, I've been talking for uh, about 10 minutes and I've just barely gotten to Postgres. So I'm gonna use PostGIS that gives uh, geographic data to uh, capabilities to Postgres SQL and PG routing, which builds on top of PostGIS to add some uh, useful functions. So the first step is to load the data. Um, I wanna make sure that you know, don't grab the whole planet, it's terabytes of size. Uh, instead, go to a download service and grab a little bit. Um, even just grabbing SoCal latest, as I showed before, that's still too big, so I'm going to use this tool Osmium to cut it down. Uh, the input's the uh, large OSM file, uh, and then I have a polygon defining the city of Glendale, and then output comes Glendale latest. Then the o uh, PG routing uh, project has uh, OSM to PG routing uh, as a uh, utility tool that will load OpenStreetMap data. So again, my input is Glendale latest, some features to dictate how to use the database, and then a configuration file that tells it what to take. So that configuration file is here. I'm just showing this because it's not super well documented on the website. Um, first, uh, max speed in the tags here is actually in kilometers per hour. That's important to know. Um, the way it works, it looks at the tags. Remember I talked about the tags for all um, nodes, ways, and relations. So it looks for tags that are named highway and have a particular set of values. So I've commented out motorway, motorway link, and motorway junction because I don't want those. Um, street sweepers don't sweep those. They also don't sweep service routes, but they do sweep these nodes, sorry, these kinds of links. Um, I've also set the max speed at 50, which is about 35 miles an hour, which is about how fast a street sweeper move when it's driving between streets. Uh, they actually, when they're sweeping, they go about six miles an hour, but that's different. So it generates a big ways table. Um, and then here's some sample data from that ways table. It uh, generates a link, length in meters. Uh, there's a source node and a target node and has this cost in seconds and a reverse cost in seconds as well. If the reverse cost is negative, that typically means you can't go that way on that street. In this case, it's a one-way street. So it has a negative uh, value. Down below here are two-way streets. So the going backwards on the street is allowed. Um, so I also made sure that um, the 50 kilometers was being used properly. If you divide 39 meters by 50 kilometers an hour, you get about 2.85 seconds. So that works. So what have we got? Uh, basically, we've just gotten the data into the database. So I'd like to move straight on to making a street network, but unfortunately, um, we have to first clean up the OpenStreetMap data. Um, so this is actually the hardest part and the longest part of my talk. So I'm gonna to try to go as quickly as I can through it, but um, rest assured, if it feels like the hour is coming to a close and I still haven't finished this part, the other parts are pretty easy. It's always true that cleaning the data is the hardest task. So the problem with OpenStreetMap is there's too many roadway segments. Um, it's easier to show on a map here. So right in the middle, um, I've got North Isabel Street and Geneva Street and some other streets. And these are, um, this is exactly what I want. So this is one block and it has one segment. So the dots on this plot are the midpoint of each segment. All around it are streets with many segments on them. So I need to um, somehow examine each segment, determine if it's a midpoint 
uh, uh, sorry, if it's an isolated segment on a block that needs to be joined with its neighbors or whether it's one long segment and so on. To do that, I'm gonna to need to use uh, recursive queries. So Postgres has with statements that hopefully everybody's using because they're super convenient to organize your long SQL statements, um, puts them into logical tables and so on. With recursive statements, I use uh, less commonly, but when I do need them, they're indispensable. So they allow you to look back at the results of your with statements so far and refer back to it. So in this case, I can you know, grow a segment of, uh, grow a sequence of, of segments into a longer line. So here's a quick refresher on what with recursive does. First, there's a non-recursive term that sets up the uh, later steps. There's a union statement or union all, and then the recursive term um, that selects from the uh, virtual table being built in this with statement. So here's the example from the database, uh, sorry, from the uh, documentation. Um, the first uh, initialization step is just values one. Then there's a union statement for the recursive step and it selects n plus one from t uh, as long as n is less than 10. And then the query is to sum all that up. Looking at this, I didn't know what it was doing. I couldn't figure it out. So I ran it and it said 55. And um, I still don't know how it got there. So instead of doing sum, I popped in select n from t and then I could see each line as it was emitted from this recursive statement. So the first initialization step emits one because it's just values one. The second one takes the result of that statement, adds one to it and emits that. The third line uh, takes the result of the previous iteration, in this case two, adds one and emits that and so on. So you get the numbers one to 10 and if you sum all those up, you get 55. So that's how it works. Um, so thinking about that, I look back again at my data. Um, each segment has a name, a source node and a target node and some other details. Uh, notice the names are not unique. So here I've got Glen Oaks Boulevard twice. Um, the source nodes are not unique in this case. They're shared here, but the targets seem to be unique. And the IDs are absolutely always unique. So I can use the IDs to uh, you know, rebuild unique identifiers and all I need to do is look at a map and you can see <clears throat> that, you know, the source nodes are sometimes shared at intersections. So for example, this intersection here is a source node for one segment, <clears throat> a target for two. And this intersection here is a source node for three segments and a target for one. So this one coming down from the top is the only one that ends in that node. And then it splits off three nodes in the other way, three segments. And these nodes here are, um, used as a source exactly once and used as a target exactly once, but they touch each other. So one segment's target is another segment's source. So that's what I want to do when I'm rebuilding, or sorry, putting together a long segment out of these sub-segments. So that's what I just said. So to get that count of source and target, um, I make a table or two tables rather. Uh, the sources table uh, goes through all of the ways um, and counts up how many times each source is used. And the targets table does the same, counting up the targets. And then I decide my potential interior segments by looking at all the records, joining with the targets table uh, on the target and joining with the source table on the source. That's these comments right here, lines rather. And then uh, only keeping those where the target count is one and the source count is one. So that's not exactly a true interior because um, some intersections actually are the source for only one uh, outgoing link and they actually are targets for a bunch of incoming links and so on because it's a mixed two-way and one-way network which complicates things a bit. But um, it's not so hard to back out of the total possible interiors, the actual interiors. And here's what I, that looks like. Um, so these are all the red points that are all the points again. Uh, the blue ones are the ones that are the possible interior segments. And then the green links here are the actual interior segments. So um, it dropped out a few of these blue ones that are actually uh, you know, touching intersections. So once I have the interior segments, I want to um, look at uh, the starts and ends. I'm gonna focus on the starts. The ends are the same as the starts. You just flip the sense of source and target and it's the same code. So a possible start, a start again is, starts from an intersection 
and has to terminate at one of these interior links on a segment. So um, here I've got uh, this query here that says where the target count is one. And then the actual starts are where the, uh, those possible starts where the start count is greater than one. Um, if you think about it, you can sort of squint and put these together as one query. Um, you're selecting from the Glendale ways, joining on targets and sources, and uh, keeping those with the target count as one and the source count is greater than one. Um, that's what this looks like. So these are all the possible starts. Looks very similar to the interior segments. And the green dots here are all of the um, actual starts. So that's actually too narrow. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, here's some start segments, they're all in green. And the initial cut has missed this red segment here. This is actually a start, but as I said before, this is a, a two-way links coming into this node here. So um, I need to account for the fact that sometimes a node is only a source for one segment, but it can be a target for a bunch of ones. So that's just this union statement here saying when the source count is one, if the target count is greater than one for that node, then it's also a start. So that adds these large green dots. And then uh, there's sometimes the name changes and I wanna make those to be starts as well. So that's uh, these really big dots, they're scattered throughout the map. And then there's another case called singletons. And again, another special case, not that important. Um, and that makes these other large green dots. Um, so the moral of the story is, you know, it's always messy. In this case, I was thinking in terms of a directed network, but in fact, it was a, you know, a mixed network and so on. So you just have to handle all those edge cases. So this is the full starts query. I'm gonna just cruise through this because I just set it all and I'm running low on time. Ends query again is almost identical. You just flip source and target, and use the same code. So now I need to get to joining those segments. So my strategy is gonna go from the end back to the start um, and recurse over uh, those segments to grow them. Um, so to do that, I need to use PostGIS functions. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, spatial processing. So a uh, quick caveat, I'm not a geographer. So if I say anything wrong, um, too bad. <laughs> um, so latitude, longitude, what are those? Uh, everybody should know a little bit about that, but the earth is a sphere. Um, latitude is degrees up or down from the equator, sort of going around the globe. South pole is at negative 90, north pole is at 90. And then longitude is um, moving left and right around uh, the earth. So from Greenwich, London, which is the meridian, East of Greenwich is positive, west of Greenwich is negative. Uh, maps are flat and need projections. So um, a projection is how to unroll that map, if you will. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds depending on the purpose of your end map. Um, the Wikipedia article is pretty good on which projection you want to use. Um, it's way more information than, than, than I wanna read about, but it's interesting. Uh, there's some that you should be aware of. There's a Mercator map that's used in tiling map libraries like Google Maps and so on. It has an equal angle property, so it works well for zooming, but it's not good for chloroplast maps. So if you wanna do something that uh, looks at, um, say the incidence of, of COVID-19 positivity rates across uh, counties in a state, don't use a Mercator projection. You wanna use an Albers projection, which has an equal area property. So it'll you can display those percentages and it actually will visually make sense and be accurate. Uh, there's also transverse Mercator. Um, it's just be aware that it exists because it's used in universal transverse Mercator. So datums are the other component here. There's a couple different kinds. Most data this, these days are in WGS84 because that's what's used by GPS detectors. So as I said a second ago, there's a thing called UTM or universal transverse Mercator. I don't know whether it's a datum or a projection or a mix of both. Again, I'm not a geographer, but I do know that it's incredibly useful. Um, so it slices the surface of the earth into 60 zones. And because they're so narrow, they can be mapped with low distortion to a fairly high degree of latitude, and long, uh, latitude north and south. Um, it's like unrolling a, a, an orange. Um, so important points, uh, if you have GPS coordinates, you probably have WGS84. So think about it that way. Um, always write latitude, longitude. So latitude again is north and south and longitude is east and west. But um, 
programs and functions and so on tend to flip the order and use it more like Cartesian coordinates. So X then Y. That's, I don't know, I hate that, but that's the way it goes. So there's a standard simple feature for SQL put out by the OpenGIS Consortium. They uh, develop lots of things, but most important for me are the well-known text and well-known binary, this point, line string, and so on. I only care about point and line string in this project. Um, so how does PostGIS fit into this? Well, they've implemented all of the simple features for SQL and then a lot more than that. Um, they've taken the well-known text and well-known binary and extended those to include the spatial referencing system for the object in question. So the SRID allows you to know what the projection and what the datum is for the object. So then you can transform into different projections. Here's a quick example of what these things look like. So in EWKT, you've got SRID and then the point. In just plain WKT, you would drop the SRID part. And line string is just a comma delimited list of uh, longitude and latitude pairs. Notice again, this is X then Y. They flipped it in the code. So I'm gonna use a bunch of functions throughout this. Um, I'm not gonna go over them now, but they're here. You can look at them later if you wanna go back and review what I did. But there's also this one weird post-GIS trick that's super useful. So when you measure geometry, so if you just use the ST length uh, and you just apply it to a geometry, you're gonna get length in degrees, which is kind of useless. So instead, you need to project your um, geometry into UTM. So in my case, I live in zone 11. So if I have my data in Glendale, I wanna project it to 32611 SRID. Um, and then the ST length call will give you meters. That is so useful. I use it all the time. Which zone should you use? Well, you can go to uh, Wikipedia and um, look up the zone, pick your correct SRID based on that. And now back to the story. Remember, we had identified the um, interior segments along these roads and identified the starts and identified the ends. I want to recurse from the end back to the start. Um, and I also need to make sure that uh, I stop at a right point. Recall recursion is two steps, initialization, and then the recursive part. So, excuse me, a quick drink of water. Um, this is my initialization step. Um, I'm making a table, a virtual table here called search graph, and I'm selecting from the ends and I'm selecting a bunch of uh, features from that end table, uh, starting with the length and the geographic ID. Initializing my depth at one, I'm gonna use that for the um, iteration stopping point. Um, collecting all of the unique IDs as a path and initializing a cycle variable as well as false. So this little bit here is the geometry call. Um, so why do I use ST as EWKT. So what I'm doing with this statement, I'm converting a binary geometry into text. And that's not free to do, but it turns out if I just uh, make an array of geometries and then try to union them, the union statement chokes and crashes because it says, well, I don't know what kind of geometries these are. Um, the problem is as soon as you make an array of geometries, Postgres loses the sense that what type uh, of, of element that is inside of it. So you have to keep casting it back. So by just writing them out as strings, I preserve all the information because it's just text. So now here's the recursive bit. Um, again, my stopping guards. I, I'm not going to go to any uh, depth longer than 100. So I won't make any segments longer than 100. That's much larger than I need. And I also make sure I don't have any cycles. I'll show how I do that in a second. I'm selecting from the interiors. So again, the initialization step started at the ends and the looping step uh, builds from the interiors. I'm joining the previous uh, step of this uh, recursion, uh, given that my current target is equal to the previous iteration's source. So again, just think about as Lego pieces that you're stacking together. I have a um, Lego piece in my hand that I'm fitting it to that growing stack and it fits perfectly if the target equals the source and if the name is the same. Collecting again, the same columns uh, but I'm growing the length and adding one to the depth. And I'm uh, prepending the current geographic ID to the growing path. Um, I'm, and you can use that path uh, by seeing if the GID 
is inside of that um, uh, growing list. So if there is, then that means it's a cycle. And a cycle means you stop. Um, anyway, so this is the geography step again, uh, geometry step. Um, focusing in on that, the make line statement, um, it works well to use both binary and well-known text. So this works perfectly well. What it does, it takes that binary geometry for the current observation and makes a line out of it and the uh, growing segments. That's a binary item, well-known binary. And so I convert it back to text for the next iteration. An alternate version is use array. Again, uh, you have to do a little bit of gymnastics to say geometry, line string, you know, cast the array. Um, it works out to be about the same amount of time, but I think the other way is cleaner, so I use it. Um, here's the results of that recursive step. Um, so there's some wrinkles here in that, um, like here I've shown North Louise Street has a depth of 19. It also has a depth of 18. So I have two results for this North Louise Street segment one with 19 elements, one with 18 segments. And also we actually have 19 results for this North Louis Street. So I wanna keep the longest one. So that's what the next bit of SQL does. It looks through and, and only keeps the longest uh, joined segments from that recursive step. It's a little bit tricky, but not too complicated. Basically I just break up the array uh, from the path, associate the longest value with each element in the array and then uh, the second uh, block here, GID max depth associate, or sorry, keeps only the, um, the longest depth for each GID. And then the last bit here rebuilds the paths, but only keeping the longest one. So all those intermediate ones go away. So North Louise Street uh, with 18 observations is disappeared. Then I make one record and add the starts to it. So that's this here. Um, I select from, uh, the search graph, join with the distinct paths to just keep the longest records, um, join in the starts where the target of the start uh, fits in with the source of the growing path, select a bunch of things from my final output. And then I have the geometry bit in here. So again, I'm making a line as I did before, converting it back to well-known text. And as I worked on this talk, I realized that's kind of redundant. I probably didn't need to do that, but what I'm doing is taking my well-known text and then converting it back again into a binary uh, sense. So I can probably delete those two commands, but I'm not gonna do that for this presentation because maybe there's something wrong. I don't know, maybe I figured something out that I need to do that. Then the last part here is a simplify preserved topology call. So if you have a whole bunch of lines that are in a straight line, I don't need those interior nodes, right? So if I piece together 19 segments from North Louis Street and they're on a perfectly straight line, then I want to eliminate all those interior segments and just keep the start and the end. So that's what this will do. If there's a, a turn or a curve that deviates more than 0 0.00001 degrees, then it's going to keep those extra nodes as it needs them. Note also I'm using a length uh, here in degrees, which is useless, but um, it doesn't mean anything really, but it's good enough, it works. Some little bit of bookkeeping to finish up and um, group together and dump to my table. So here's the final output. This is what I started with, and this is what I end up with. So this was great. I was super happy when this came out. Um, there's still some problems here and there, like you know these nodes, there's two nodes on this network, or two segments rather, and two segments in this line, but it's good enough. Um, I reduced my total number of segments by about 40%, which is a huge impact on the problem size. Again, this is MP hard, so the smaller you can get in, the much smaller the search space. So where do we stand? I've made OpenStreetMap and I've cleaned it. So the next step is to make that street network. So I'm gonna to try to go fast through this and luckily it's not actually that hard. Um, I'm gonna make a routable street network of curbs. Um, OSM data has information on one-way streets and two-way streets and in theory, PG routing can analyze um, a mixed network. But in practice, I wasn't good enough to make it work without hitting a whole bunch of bugs. So I just said, well, let's just concentrate on the curbs make myself a direct network. That's what I just said. So um, I have a big SQL statement um, for all this stuff. And I'm gonna quickly go over the details here. Um, I set up first a, a serial sequence so I can make sure that each curve has a unique ID. 
Um, and then I use my one weird trick. Um, I've converted the geometry from the um, new Glendale Ways table into the 32611 uh, SRID. So again, I've got, I've got it into a um, UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator. So I get meters. And then to make the right-hand side, I know because I'm a transportation engineer that lanes are about um, 12 feet wide. So two meters to the right will get me the curb if it's a two lane street. So that's what I'm doing here. And then I cast it back to 4326, which is uh, WGS. And then I have to reverse the sense of it because of the way offset curve works. In order to make sure I get the movement correct, I need to reverse it. So that's my right-hand side. Uh, the left-hand side is different depending on whether it's two-way or one-way. Um, the two-way street is a positive two meter offset. Um, again, convert back to 4326. And then again, reverse the sense of it. And I know it's a, a, a two-way street if the reverse cost is positive. Uh, One-way streets are similar, uh, but you don't have to reverse the sense of it um, because you're moving in the correct direction at that point. And the reverse cost of negative uh, tells me this is a one-way street, but I definitely want to be sweeping that left-hand side curb, so I do have to make it. So all the left-hand sides are the union of the two different kinds of left-hand side. I make a left-hand curb table, uh, make a right-hand curb table, and uh, then I make a final union of those two to make my curbs table, and I insert that into a new curbs graph, and I'm done. So that makes this, which is kind of underwhelming, but uh, again, very useful. I've made a routable network now of uh, directed links. So where are we? I've got my street map and I've got my street curb networks. Now I need to make a line graph and then travel times. So line graph is actually one of the easiest things I did. Um, to revisit again, what is a uh, line graph? So network graph, the intersections are nodes and the streets are links. In a line graph, the streets are nodes and the links represent legal movements. So thinking about that, if you're at a node here on sweeping the right-hand side of the street, um, you can move straight to the next curb or you can turn left to the right side or turn left to the left side, or you can make a U-turn and sweep the other side of the street. So putting all those together for this uh, fairly simple intersection produces all of these links. So these nodes have to have these links. Luckily, I don't have to do any of that because uh, PG routing has an excellent function called uh, PGR line graph. Um, you need to pass it a little bit of SQL to look at your, um, tell how to get the ID and source and so on, but then it does the job. So this is what it looks like. Here's my links and it converts my curb graph into a line graph. Zooming in a little bit, see what's going on for real. Um, you can kind of see that you know the turnaround links are also in there. It's doing the correct movements and so on. So there, I've got my routable network. Um, so I'm ready to go on that uh, data pipeline. Next, I need to do travel times. Um, to do that, we need to make an all-to-all -all matrix. It's again, almost a one-liner, um, so close and yet so far. Um, so there's a function again, it takes a little bit of SQL as text and then a list of uh, vertex IDs. So in the uh, documentation, it shows this. In my case, I have this. So I'm selecting my ID, the source, the target, uh, the target length in meters as the uh, forward cost, the reverse cost, which is just set to negative one. Um, so it, it'll never route down a negative path. Um, and then for my source vertices, I just picked all the sources, but I quickly ran out of RAM because 9,000 curbs makes an 84 million uh, wide uh, matrix. And it, it, you know, PGR Dijkstra, the Dijkstra algorithm has to keep everything in memory as it goes. So it just runs out of RAM. So I do a little bit of ugly hacking. I made a function, um, standard function body initialization step. I limited the ID block. So instead of picking all the vertices, I picked just 3,000 of them. Um, and then I have the same command as before, select asterisk from PGR Dijkstra cost matrix. Uh, this subselect quote literal is just the text line from before. So the same thing, I'm picking the ID and source from my uh, curb line graph. And then I'm uh, from my vertices for each iteration, I'm picking the um, IDs out of ID block, that 3000 limited vert vertices. 
And then I insert it into the line graph matrix. And if there's any conflicts, do nothing. So I've got a loop inside my function that repeats eight times. Um, it starts at zero and increases each time by a thousand. And this call here, execute insert SQL using start ID. So that again, the start ID is used inside this ID block. So the source has to be greater than the start ID. So if you think about it, I'm moving uh, in steps of a thousand each time I'm taking a window of 3000. So I have some overlaps, but you could be also thinking about it. You realize that there's a big bug here and that you know, the initial 3000 will never overlap with the final uh, 3000. So instead of doing that, I thought about it a while, uh, flailed about, and then I said, oh, I can just sample the underrepresented. So I have a, a growing matrix of observations. If I just pick the ones that are not represented in that matrix and make sure they're in every call, then gradually I'll build up my full matrix. So to do that, I used an ordered set aggregate function called a percentile cont or continuous percentile. So here is how that works. Um, I have an uh, SID count, so the unique starting ID, and I sort it by count. For the low block, I'm picking the lowest 500. And then uh, I have this percentile count call that tells me where is the lowest seventh percentile uh, based on count. So then the high block says, take everything from that sorted count matrix that's greater than the uh, lowest seventh percentile and randomize them and then limit them to 2,500. So I'm still picking 3,000 nodes, but I'm uh, picking, making sure 500 are from the low block and 2,500 are from the high block. Union those and then run the call. So after a while that works, I ran it a bunch of times. Um, eventually I have, uh, everything should have 9193 um, observations. Most of them are within one or two of that. It's good enough. So then finally we can solve the street sweeping problem, uh, pump all this data into our tools. Um, if you were here hoping to find out how to do that, uh, I can't talk about that because it's really outside the scope. Um, some quick benchmarks. It, right now it takes about 20 minutes to generate the initial solution. So it just churns away in the data and 20 minutes later you get your first cut and then it can run for hours, just improving that over time. This is okay because you know, you're know you not gonna redo street sweeping every morning. You kind of wanna want to run it once per season or per quarter. Um, but it's also difficult to visualize the output because OR Tools just dumps a list for each truck that tells it where to go. So that's the last bit here. Um, if you, so I deliberately save the geometry with the results of each link. So if it says, here's the list of, of routes that uh, street sweeper number A has to cover, then I also include the geometry. I do that because then PostGIS, sorry, QGIS can display it directly. So here's a QGIS view of Glendale. And here is the view of all of the routes that my solver generated. So that's nice, uh, but it doesn't tell you very much about how these routes are interleaved and so on. If you zoom in on just one route, you can see it here. Um, it's doing what it's doing, but it doesn't really give you a sense of the movement. Where's the vehicle coming from and going to and so on. So um, that's what I just said. So then I moved on to animating. Um, there's lots of blog posts for this. Uh, I, if you search for GeoGiffery, you'll uh, find some good posts. I like this guy's post here. Um, his approach was to use QGIS's Atlas functionality. So he makes an image stack and then he's sort of like a flip book, you know. Uh, so Atlas allows you to control a print view and each frame is controlled by the next street being swept. Um, and then I just used FFmpeg to stitch together the stitches, uh, stitch together the images. So uh, it actually looks terrible. And if you have any sort of epilepsy tendencies or don't like flashing lights, uh, look away for a couple seconds. Um, and if you have a weak stomach, also look away. Um, so yeah, my daughters were horrified by this and said, that's not an animation, that's just horrible. Um, so the problem is that you know, each frame moves one block and the blocks aren't the same size. So I had to turn to um, PostGIS again to snip up the roads into equal sizes. So there's a command called st line substring that takes a geometry, starting fraction, ending fraction, and will snip that geometry uh, 
and do you know, the points you want. So the documentation for ST line substring also says you can use this to break a line into n different parts uh, from zero to n minus one. And um, this is the code they show in the documentation. Here's the snipping bit. And then down here, they have this uh, generate series zero to 10,000 uh, to make sure that you know, 10,000 is just a, an arbitrary big number. I didn't like the arbitrary big number. I figured, well, I, I know how long my roads are. And I know how long I want them to be. So I can figure out how many, uh, how long my series needs to be. And I also reorganize the statement with with statements. So again, I used that one weird trick to find out the length of the longest state, uh, longest segment. I transform to uh, SRID 32611. I uh, got the max length from that. And then uh, the max iteration value is just that maximum length divided by 25. So then using that max iteration, I could generate my uh, necessary length of my series. Um, and then I can use that series value inside my snipping statement. So here, I'm also uh, creating a frame number so that you know, I know the order of these um, frames. So if I take one road that has some ID, I just say, oh, well, the IDs increment uh, sequentially throughout the routes. So I just add in a little bit of decimal value to that ID and I get my frame. So I can put these in order. Um, and then the, the substring statement, I just follow along with what was in the code, take the geometry, and I'm gradually moving a window from the beginning to the end so I can piece together the street, save it into a table, and then here's the results of that. Um, hopefully you can all see this and it's not stressing the bandwidth too much, but it's much smoother. Um, you know, the, the vehicle's moving along, but right there it was pretty jerky. Every time the vehicle changes direction, the screen still jerks around. So there's a bonus, I get arrowheads. Uh, the previous animation was just the street and now I've got an arrowhead moving along a street because it's moving every 25 meters. Uh, but there's still room for improvement. It sort of jumps around. So the last thing I did, and this is the last thing for my talk, I made a point of view table. So um, the Atlas functionality can have a hidden view where it centers the, the picture and it, you don't need to show that. And so I just said, well, all I need to do is sort of spatially average where the vehicle is coming from and going to instead of following the vehicle exactly. So I did that. Um, I use uh, the ST collect, which is a spatial aggregate function. And I used um, a windowing function over uh, ordered by universe, the UID. So unique ID for each geometry. Um, and I did the two preceding rows and 10 following rows. So. If you think about that, you know, the immediate past history will always be in the window, but I'm gonna cheat to where the vehicle's going to go. So that way the camera is sort of panning ahead of the vehicle just a little bit. And then uh, given that I make the centroids and then I save those centroids to the table. So every single frame of the animation has a unique uh, point of view that should be the center for that frame. So the results uh, can be showed on a map. Um, Again, for the animation, you would hide this, but I just want to show you what it looks like. So this is a window with the two preceding and 10 following, uh, 10 upcoming nodes. So these are the, the centroid points. So it sort of smooths off the curves, as you see. If you make a bigger window, you'll get more smoothing. And an even bigger window, you get even more smoothing. So the problem with getting too big a window is, I mean, if you conceivably you can do you know 10,000 before and 10,000 after, but that would be the entire route in one picture. So if you're zooming in on an area, the vehicle will drive off the edge of the frame. So there's a, there's a link between the amount of aggregation you do and the size of your window. So I'm actually developing a website to show this using JavaScript. And so I've uh, set up a relationship between the size of the, of the window on my screen and how much uh, spatial aggregation I wanna do for the point of view. So here's the smoother animation with a 210 window. It's a bit better, um, but the vehicle's still sort of in the middle of the frame here. And then this larger window, uh, so 40 nodes before, 50 nodes after. Again, each remember each segment is 25 meters. So 40 times 25 is about how much space uh, it could maximally have um, in each frame. And this is smoother. This works well for this size of animation window. And you can see the vehicle moving around. And that's about it. 
So that's the end of my talk. Are there any questions? So far, there's only been one question, and that's, would you be able to share the scripts you used for cleaning the OSM data? Um, yeah, so most of it is in this presentation, uh, which will be made available uh, as a video. I'm also going to put up the, you know, the raw slides um, on my website. Um, so I, I think in my in the bio for this talk or the synopsis, I have a link to the draft slides. I'm going to put the actual slides in the same spot so they'll be findable. Um, for the most part, it's it's all in there. If it's not, I, I can also make a um, you know a, a GitHub repository. It's not I can't share all the so I can't just dump the project to GitHub, but I'm sure I can without too much effort um, extract just the scripts. So. So yes, long-winded. Thank you for that. Um, another question has come in. What problems did you have when analyzing with PG routing? So um, there, there is there are a couple of functions in PG routing to solve um, uh, different variables. So I use it a lot in this project. Actually, when I'm when you're making that that matrix of distances, you know that that's crucial. Um, the other way to do it, you can just individually start from some origin, some destination and say, hey, you know, route, find the best route from A to B. Um, and all those functions work well. What didn't work for me was when I dipped into the experimental stuff. So another way to think about street sweeping is also to think of it as a Chinese postman problem. Um, and there's a Chinese postman problem solver in there, but it didn't work on problems that are this large. So obviously it, it, it crashed. Um, and on smaller problems, I had some instabilities uh, where you know, running it three times in a row, the third time would crash. Um, and I guess I, I actually just got a, a notification on the GitHub issue on that that I raised that that's been solved in the latest version. So the basic aspects of it work really well. Um, the more experimental things and the solvers aspect of it, I don't think work as well, especially not given how many constraints I wanted to throw into this. Um, I, I was reading up on, on the plans and the issues in GitHub and so on and PG routing. And I, you know, recently there's some work to try to include a different routing library in it. And in my opinion, that's the wrong way to go. I think it's great for the basic stuff, like just shortest path from A to B, or how do you get from A to B, you know, the, the five best routes and so on. Those sort of basic algorithms work really well. But as soon as you start to try to solve larger problems, I think it's not the right tool for the job. Does that answer the question? I'd say so. <laughs> um, another, uh, the question asker is saying yes. Um, another one, did you run into geometry issues with the OSM data as in connected things not actually being connected in the real world and vice versa? Uh, yes, actually, there was one point uh, that, that that did happen. Um, so I grew up in Burbank, which is a street right across from Glendale. So I kind of was familiar with various things. And um, I just arbitrarily zoomed in to check things out. And I came across the street that I, I know recently had reconfigured itself. Um, and you could see that the open street map data had a through movement where now there was a forced right-hand turn. They blocked off the street. It's right next to, I think, Toll Middle School and or junior high or high school. I don't remember. Um, anyway, um, they've made it so that, you know, the, the flow of traffic around the high school or the school there only goes in one direction. You can't go straight through on the other side. So they've made a one-way street where there used to be a two-way street. And that wasn't an open street map. So actually, I just changed it. I, you know, you correct it yourself. Um, there weren't very many um, missing links in this city, at least. It had been well edited over the years. So a lot of the, a lot of the problems with open street map is there can be a link that doesn't touch its neighbor. Um, so that seems to be fairly good here. In other cities, you probably want to take a look at that. Um, uh, but again, the great thing about OpenStreetMap is if you find errors, it's fairly straightforward to go in there and fix them using their tools. Great. For the sake of time, I'm going to combine uh, two questions into one, um, and then we have one more. So 
did you consider Valhalla routing, which Tesla uses, or Mobility DB? Uh, I don't know Mobility DB. I did look at Valhalla. I also looked at, um, uh, I can't remember what it is. The same guys who make Valhalla, you know, the, the um, Mapbox folks or that sort of world. Um, OSM routing, something like that. Anyway, um, so I, I, there's, a, there's a project called uh, OSM routing or something similar. My brain's just gapping out uh, that I've used a lot. Um, so I, you, with that one, you can load up the OpenStreetMap data and then uh, set up sort of a service that you send it origin destination information and it'll get you back a shortest path. Valhalla does a similar thing. In this case, um, I needed the actual network to convert into a line graph, right? And there's nothing in Valhalla or um, the OSM routing project, whatever that was called. I wish I could remember. Anyway, um, that will give you the line graph. Um, it was a funny thing where I was actually asking about that and then suddenly I was contacted by some of the developers for other questions, but you know, it was sort of like, how do you, how do you use the embedded C code that's you know, the representation of that graph? Can you get at that in order to turn that into a line graph? Um, but you can't. So for my purposes, I really needed to get something where I could get the line graph. So PG routing worked great because it had that you know, line graph function that did all my work for me. I actually did nothing for that, it's simple. All I needed to do was make my routable network. Um, so I, you know, those are good projects, but they weren't good for this. The other advantage of PG routing is I could make that network, the all to all network matrix once and save that um, in the database, do all that work once, and then just query it when I needed it. Whereas with um, the OSM routing project that I've used, I typically have to do that. I can't cache it on the database side. I have to cache it on my program side. So I hit the service a bunch of times to build something, and then I save it as a file, which is kind of hacky and gross. Um, I'd much rather have a table in the database that I can just query next time I run my solver. Um, I think the consensus in the chat is that the name of the project you're trying to remember is OSRM. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, and open, source, open source routing machine. Exactly. Um, and our final question here, um, which I think is a particularly good one because I had the same question. If you had to take into account traffic for driving cars and not a street sweeper, would you use a different set of data or a different API to get the route options and travel times and then apply a similar approach? Um, well, no. Um, so a couple things. Uh, first, the um, OR tools solver doesn't allow you to do dynamic travel times, right? So. Um, you might, there's been a lot of discussion back and forth over the years. If you're in the C++ um, API of, of OR tools, you can set up something that has what's called uh, you know, a state dependent um, travel time. So you can say, hey, it's now 10 o'clock. What is my travel time on this link? But um, according to the lead developer, that's a bad idea because it's really, really slow. You know, it slows everything down as far as the, the solver is concerned. It can't, can no longer optimize based on, you know, it's sort of first principles and now has to wait. Okay, I can't necessarily rule that link out because if it comes in a different state, then it's, it's a different um, choice. So OR tools to begin with doesn't like that aspect of it. So you can't put in dynamic traffic. Um, on the other hand, what uh, the way to do it, um, and, and the answer sort of is yes, uh, is you just sort of scale it along. So remember the street sweepers have a certain period of time that they're allowed to be sweeping a certain zone. So, you know, if it's Monday from 10 to one, the traffic on Monday from 10 to one is fairly consistent, right? If it's from 8 a.m. To, to 10 a.m., that's more of a rush hour traffic. So you can sort of look at the streets and decide, but at the same time, you know, the cities also know that too. So they don't put their busiest streets um, to be swept in the early morning. Um, they usually put them at different times of day. So another feature with these MP heart problems is you definitely want to break them up into smaller chunks. So um, you can break up, you know, just based on the zones, know the time of day of that zone, and then go and, and tweak the travel time 
on streets to be um, what you need for that time of day. The other uh, issue is that um, the street sweepers, when they're sweeping, move at about six miles an hour. Um, and they're on the side of the road out of the way. But you know, when they're actually moving sort of deadheading, they, they will slow down traffic too. So another aspect of this, the call we were originally responding to is they wanted to make sure that street sweepers weren't slowing down traffic. And similar for like a garbage truck problem, same deal. Garbage trucks definitely block traffic. So they wanna to try to minimize the impact of these vehicles on traffic by being able to change their routes as they saw fit. So they said, hey, this isn't working. We wanna be able to change it. And that's why they want this sort of a tool. Wonderful. Um, well, those are all of our questions. Um, and I think that's all of our time. Okay. So with that, thank you, thank you, thank you, James. This was wonderful. Um, really fascinating way you, you solved a, a problem. Thank you to everyone who joined and participated. James, you're actually getting a ton of praise in chat right now. Oh, okay. uh, good. <laughs> fantastic. I take a look after to boost my ego. Oh, um, yeah. If anybody has any more questions too, uh, I don't know if my email's on that um, list, but um, I'm, I'm certainly open to answering any questions uh, offline if you want to shoot me an email. Great. I'll put it in the chat as soon as I get off this. Okay, wonderful. So regardless of where you are, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and um, I will see you back here next week. Cheers, thank you. Okay, thank you.